So my name's Carl Scotland. Uh, I work for Tech Systems Global Services. Um, I lead our agile practice in Europe. Um, I've been consulting, coaching, consulting for I don't know ten or so years, and I guess I've been doing agile for about over twenty years now. Um, so what I want to talk about today is I guess some of the stuff I've been thinking about recently around predictability. What does predictability mean for agile teams for agile organisations? Um, so if we start with you know why do we want to talk about predictability? Um, we think back to you know Gabby's talk yesterday, and, and uh, I think a theme that I've picked up in a certain and a lot of talks over the today yesterday is around uh, outcomes. So we want our organisations to be more successful. That's why they bring us in as coaches. That's why we help them through organisational and agile transformations. What do we mean by helping them being more successful? Um, I tend to think about it in terms of these six things: so value, productivity, predictability, responsiveness, quality, and sustainability. Um, and quite often, organisations want to, want to know, how do we know we're getting better? How do we know whether the coaching is having an impact? Um, and most of these, I can, I can give a good answer to. So for responsiveness, um, so how quickly we're delivering work, we can measure something like lead time. Um, for sustainability, can work be delivered in the longer term? Uh, we can talk about employee engagement. So are our employees happy? If our employees are happy, probably we're going to be sustainable. Or maybe we can look at the code base and take some static code metrics um, and think if we've got a sustainable code base. For value, um, value tends to be very contextual, um, but at a very simple level, we can talk about probably usually in financial terms or maybe in product terms, unit sales, something of those things. Um, quality, fairly easy to measure, escape defects, customer service calls, those sorts of things. Productivity is usually throughput or number of releases we're making. But when we get to predictability, I kind of struggle to have a good answer about how do we measure predictability. If we're kind of trying to show that we are becoming more predictable, how do we do that? So um, this talk is, is trying to get into that a little bit. What do we mean by predictability and how might we measure that? Um, so first off, definition of predictability. There's two that I pulled out of Miriam Webster. First one, um, so being able to know, see, or declare in advance. Now, I think what most businesses and execs, leaders, this, this is the kind of what they want to know. They want to know what am I going to get, when am I going to get it. That's what they mean by predictable. And typically, they don't know. They have no, no idea what they're going to get, when they're going to get it. Um, the second one, behaving in a way that is expected, um, I think is, is, is useful, but I tend to think about people being reliable rather than being predictable, and, and I'll come back to that one. So I really want to focus on how can we help organisations have a better understanding to be able to know, see, or declare in advance what they're going to get and when they're going to get it. Um, a lot of what I'm talking about today is, is hypothesis. Um, I've played around with some of these things. Um, I'm trying to figure this out myself. Um, I've talked to Dan in particular about it, and they were, they were useless. They didn't give me a good answer, so I had to go and try and figure it out for myself. Um, so what I'm hoping today is I'll give them the answer. They'll tell me I'm wrong, and now then they'll tell me why I'm, what the right answer is. Um, but actually, part of this is, is kind of saying, if I can go out and kind of just throw some ideas out there, maybe you'll kind of get some ideas. You'll go away and try and, and test some of these hypotheses yourself, um, and then we kind of get a, a, a broader range of experiments going on as to, as to kind of figure out what do we mean by predictability. Um, so the first one, um, let's talk about say do metrics because that's usually that's, that's, that's the elephant in the room, I think. Um, it's usually the first thing when I, when I talk about predictability that, that they talk about um, what, do we, what you know, how do we measure it? So velocity predictability. Um, how many points do we plan versus how many points do we actually deliver? Um, this is, so this is a screenshot from, from Azure DevOps. Um, it's actually uh, not too bad because if you'll see in this screenshot, they're defining velocity as a count of work item. So at least we're not using story points. Um, we'll, we'll not go there. Um, I, this, is, this is something, it's useful for some teams that are really bad at planning sprints. Um, so I'm, I'm not saying don't do this. Um, but if I go back to that definition where I said the second de definition is about reliability, um, I've seen teams that are highly predictable because I know that they will always plan twice, three times as much work into a sprint that they can deliver, and I know they're not going to deliver it. That's not the sort of predictability we're looking for. Um, um, so I think about that as like, can a team reliably deliver? But then even if you're reliably delivering within a sprint, does that really help the business predict over the longer term? I'm, I'm not sure it does. So, so not a waste of time, but I don't think it's really what we're looking for when we talk about predictability. 
The other one, um, let's get it out of the way, safe program predictability. Um, so if you're not familiar with this, safe, uh, safe kind of, when you plan a PI, PI is like a number of sprints, typically a quarter. Um, you have these objectives, um, so you identify a number of objectives, so uh, credit where it's due, at least we're talking about outcomes here with objectives. Um, and then you score the plan, so you kind of scale of 1 to 10, so now we're back into the realms of making up numbers. What's the value, 1 to 10, of the objective, and then what did we actually deliver? And then we can kind of have a little percentage here, and we want it between 80 percentage. So, okay, it's going to help you as a PI be more reliable and make sure that you're not planning too much work in and give you some feedback if you are planning too much work in and maybe you're not focusing and delivering on the business objectives. Um, but is it really, as a business, helping you more predictable and helping those kind of C-level execs know what, they can, what they're going to get and when they're going to get in the future? Again, I'm not sure it does. Um, so I think both of these kind of fall into this trap of let's just make some numbers up and because we've got some numbers and we can create some graphs out of it, um, that proves our point. Um, so, useful, but I don't think they're, they're the answer. So, okay, so what is the answer? So the first thing I started looking at uh, was the idea of lead time variation. Um, so, let's quote Deming first. Um, a process that is not in statistical control has not a definable capability. Its performance is not predictable. So Deming is saying here, basically saying a system is predictable or it's not. Um, and who am I to argue with Deming? Um, well, I'm going to try. <laughs> I'm going to add some nuance to that. Um, what Deming is saying is uh, a system has a probability. Well, if you've got a stable system, it will behave in a certain way, and we can now... So what we're really talking about is getting into probabilistic thinking rather than deterministic thinking. So it's not about you are predictable, you, you know, we know exactly what we're going to get. We're starting to think about let's understanding the behaviour of the system and what's the probability of certain things happening within that system. So the way we can do that is look at uh, our lead time and the, the, the variation of the lead time. So um, this is a screenshot from Action Agile. Julie's in the room in the back. Go talk to them if you want to figure out how to do this. Um, we're, we're just good friends. This is, you know, I'm not, they're not paying me to do this. Um, so, so the hypothesis here is that this, this kind of data on, the, on this side here is less predictable, and this data here is more predictable. So what do we mean by that? Um, actually, when I say less predictable, and this is where I'm going to argue with Deming, I think what I mean here, I'm not going to argue with Deming, I'm going to kind of say my interpretation of, 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 of the way, what kind of Deming, or what you, you could interpret Deming. I think the data on the left is more useful. You're going to get a more useful prediction with the data on the left, sorry, a less useful prediction with the data on the left and more useful prediction with the data on the right. It's, it's still predictable, but is that predictability useful or not? So, um, the, kind of explain the run chart. Each of these dots represents a piece of work. Where it is horizontally kind of tells us when it was finished. Where it is horizontally tells us what the cycle time of that piece of work was, how long it took to get done. Um, and then what we can do here is uh, we can look at this 85th percentile. So 85% of the dots are below this line, 15% of the dots are above this line. Uh, and so we can say we've got an 85% chance of work being completed in 16 days or less. So that's, that's predictable, um, probabilistic. Um, the other thing we get from this, though, is the, the line down here. Now, it's... Ideally, I'd have liked this to have been 15%, but the, the data didn't give me 15%. So 20%, it doesn't, you know, what those numbers are, 85 to 20%, doesn't really matter. But we can also say there's a 20% chance of working being completed in two days or less. Um, so we might take 16 days, it might take two days. So you've kind of got this gap here where there's a 65% chance of work being completed between two and 16 days. Now imagine that wasn't 2 and 16 days, imagine that was 2 and 160 days. So it's a predictable system, but if somebody says when's it going to be done in kind of, well, it might be 2 days, it might be 160 days, is that really useful? So that's kind of where I'm kind of trying to go with this, is, is okay, it's predictable, but how can we make that predictability more useful? We do it by reducing the range, reducing the variability of the system. So, for example, 
I took that data set and I basically cut all those lead times in half to show that now we've got an 85th percentile of eight days, the 20th percentile is one day, so uh, there's now a 65% chance of work being completed between one and eight days. I think that's more useful and you'd be able to, be able to predict how much work you can get done in the future in a better way. So that's kind of my hypothesis is that we, if we can look at the variability of our lead time and show that it's getting narrower, we can show that we're becoming more predictable. So actually, how do you put a number on that? A couple of ways I thought you could come up with it. One is the idea of, of cycle time inequality. So this is building on the idea of the way they measure income inequality. So in income, in, in, uh, income inequality, you take the P90 and the P10. So the 90th percent of incomes, the 10%, the, the lower 10% of incomes, and you look at the ratio. Um, the higher the ratio, the less equality of incomes. And again, it's just looking at the gap. Um, so on our data set one, if we take the P85 and P20, because that's the data we have, uh, P85 is 16, P20 is 2, and the cycle time inequality is 8. I've just realised I forgot to warn everybody there's maths in this talk. Um, <laughs> if you don't like maths, I mean, said that, I'm, it's not complicated maths, and uh, you, you might just have to trust me on some of this. Um, so, cycle time inequality of 8 for there. So let's look at our data set 2, P85 of 8, P20 of 1. Oh, cycle time inequality of 8 again. Okay. Uh, it's kind of a, when I first did that, it was a bit of a, oh, um, doesn't work. <laughs> um, so my first hypothesis, I've just learned um, that it doesn't work. So, okay, there's another way. Cycle time coefficient of vari variation. Uh, this is where you're going to have to trust me on the maths. Coefficient of variation, the ratio of the standard deviation to the mean, um, the extent of the variability in relation to the population mean, higher the ratio, less equality there is. So, data set one. Trust me, standard deviation was 7.33, mean 7.37, coefficient of cycle time coefficient of variation 0.78. Data set 2 comes out as 0.76, there's a bit of rounding, but it's basically the same thing again. I have to say, I, I didn't understand this, I really had to figure out why it was the same. It was quite, I, and I had to go back and check my maths multiple times, but it, I think it's because the means dropped as well, so the variations dropped and the means dropped. So, oh! Um, so at that point, it's like, okay, well, maybe I'm just kind of banging my head against a wall here. Um, and as somebody pointed out, why don't you just take the, you know, just take the gap, the number of days, and, you know, maybe, it's, maybe I was just overcomplicating this. Um, but I kind of then kind of started thinking, well, okay, well, what we're measuring there is a, is a trailing indicator. So it tells us whether we're predictable. Maybe a better way we'll be looking at this is to look for leading indicators of whether we're likely to be more predictable or not. Um, so what we're trying to do is, you know, we're still trying to reduce the cycle time, um, but the risk of just looking at the variability, and I think with, you know, the, the learning of looking at that coefficient of variation is that you can reduce the cycle time in two ways. And what we want to do is we want to make these long ones shorter. We don't want to make these short ones longer. Um, so we don't want to make, become more predictable by taking longer and making everything longer. So basically, we want to look at our aging whip. So done in particular yesterday, there's one metric you look at, look at aging whip. Um, um, I think actually, if we look at aging whip, we can correlate that to being more predictable. So I'm going to just explain this chart. Again, I love this chart from Maximal Agile. Um, I, it took me a while to get my head around it, so hopefully I'll try and explain it. Um, you've, it's, that same, it's based on that same data set. So you've got the 85th percentile at 16 days, etc. So. This line here and these bars are saying 85% of work is done in 16 days. And then we look at how, what percentage of work does it take to get into testing. So 85% of work goes from dev done into testing in 14 days. So we're basically looking at the flow through our process um, and the percentage of the work gets through to each stage. Um, so 85% of work is in dev in 13 days. 85% in data active in 10 days, 85% in analysis done in five days. So what this is telling us is we've got, and there's, there's these, there's little three, you can't really see it, there's a three on there, it basically means that dot represents three pieces of work. Those pieces of work already have a more than 85% probability of taking longer than 16 days. That's what this chart is telling us. Anything that's in that orange zone, 
we want to be paying attention to. And if there's anything in the red zone, we really want to be paying attention to. Um, so if we know that things are going to take longer and we can pay attention to those sooner, we can start bringing down those higher dots on the run chart, which is going to naturally reduce the variability, but it's going to reduce the variability by making things shorter rather than making things longer. So that's kind of my hypothesis at the moment, is, is looking at aging WIP. And basically, so another, this isn't kind of a dashboard that Action Large Job gives you. It gives you your WIP age, uh, and the average WIP age for today, last week, last month. So um, actually, in this data set, um, I think it looks like kind of things are, our, our average WIP is getting worse for, for this example here. It was, last month it was 5.37, now it's WIP age. So we could look at that and kind of, if we see our average WIP age, trending down, that's a good thing, and that means we're probably going to be more predictable, um, and that, that's a better data set. Um, how much time have I got? 15 minutes? So um, the next step then is, is to think about, well, what's causing that whip to age, and can we learn anything from that? So the kind of the last thing is uh, looking at blockers. Um, typically work ages because it gets stuck, because it gets blocked. So this is now looking at a, a different app. So this is from Troy McGuinness, and here's a, a blocked app. So he's, this is looking at the number of things that are blocked and how long they've been blocked for. So you can see the kind of different colours up here. So actually if we track how much work is blocked and how long it's blocked for, again, it kind of gives us something to pay attention to, but which are the pieces of work that have been blocked for more than 30 days, uh, and what can we do about unblocking those? And then we can see uh, these things here are the things that are being resolved. So tracking, are we resolving blockers? Are blockers getting blocked for too long? Um, and then the bottom one is, is kind of net flow of blockers. So are we, are we blocking more items than we're resolving, or are we res resolving more items than we're blocking? So if we're just seeing lots of work getting blocked and nothing ever getting resolved, again, that's going to give us a leading indicator that our whip age is going to get longer, and therefore our lead time is going to get longer. So this is really my, my current, current hypothesis um, that I kind of want to dig into a little bit more. Um, so I believe that measuring blockers is the first point, will result in less aged work in process, so that's going to help us manage our aging whip. Um, that's going to result in longer, fewer, sorry, in fewer long lead time work items. That's going to make the system more consistent. So by more consistent, I mean, you know, less variability. Um, and that's going to um, mean that we're more predictable. Um, so how am I going to test this? Well, ultimately, you know, it's a kind of more subjective test around talking to stakeholders and you have more confidence in your plans. But that's really what we're trying to get to. Um, our, our leaders, our, our managers, our execs kind of saying, OK, when, when you tell us how much you're going to deliver and when you're going to deliver it, um, we have confidence in, in, in that's what's going to happen. Not, not a guarantee. It's not deterministic. It's still probabilistic. But, you know, given that 85 percentile should be good enough. Um, just a, a, kind of a, this is this is my last point, and we'll kind of go into the Q and A, which is, would just to I guess re-emphasise. I'm kind of worried that I do this talk and people kind of think I'm obsessed with predictability and absolute predictability. Um, we still want, you know, there's still value in deviation. There's still value in variability. So a couple of quotes, you know, without that deviation, you don't innovate, you don't make progress, um, and you know, sometimes you want to see that deviation and figure out how to exploit it. Um, so. Predictability is just one of those six areas, and that's why I want to look at those six areas, um, so that if we're over obsessing on predictability, it's not having an impact. Because you know, one way of being predictable is just to take a long time over everything, pad everything. What you'd see there is your throughput going down, so you'd be less productive, or maybe you'll be less responsive, um, or, or you know, maybe you're kind of rushing things through, and it has an impact on quality. So we want to make sure that by measuring predictability we're not kind of having a negative impact on all the other, all the other things. So um, that was it. Well, I rattled through that really quickly. So I, felt like, I know I, I did rush through some of the maths there. Um, kind of give you, actually, before, um, before I give you questions, I'm just going to plug Lee Agile Lee Brighton while I've kind of got the, uh, got the microphone. So Friday, October the 21st, uh, Lee Agile Brighton is back. We're kind of doing a one-day single track conference. Uh, got a nice new venue near the station. Um, which was purpose-built during COVID, so definitely COVID-friendly. 
Um, so hopefully we'll come see you then. Uh, I know Julia's on the programme agreed, so we'll be announcing that. Uh, Dan and Pratik might be on the reserve list. Um, I think I'm gonna, I think I talked Gabby into talking as well yesterday, last night as well. All right, so enough of that. Uh, how much do we, do we have time for questions? Yeah, you've got 10 minutes. Oh, I've got 10 minutes for questions. All right. <laughs> any, any really different questions for Dan in particular at the back? Yeah. So your, um, your kind of basis is uh, on how predictable uh, the work items are, and you're measuring days or, uh, for completion. How do you, um, that seems to be dependent on how big the piece of work is. So how do you get for your measurements to be valid? Do you not have to have some sort of consistency on the size of work? Um, so, without trying to make them exactly the same, I mean, the, I think the smaller the items, so we talk about right sizing, um, but having said that, I don't, I, it still works, because you're looking at the system, you're looking at the whole data set, and um, probably the mix of work items in the future is going to be similar to the mix of uh, work items in the past. Now, if you know that's going to change, and you know that the mix of work items in the future is going to be different to the past, probably that's going, to, that's going to impact on your ability to forecast. But usually there's a kind of fairly similar mix. Um, what I would probably tend to do rather than estimating is maybe have different work item types and then you can segment by work item type. Um, but actually usually it just, it's just mix, it's just natural variation um, and you're always going to get that natural variation. Having said that, trying to right size things and make things smaller means that you'll get things done more quickly um, and will make things more consistent in sizing. So still a good thing to do. Can I just Mike? add that that's a non-linear benefit as well. Um, I, I studied some on my own data and found that when we, we had what we called the five day rule and how long items, how big items are allowed to be and that became the two day rule. And we found that it reduced our, it reduced the time reduce the likelihood of things getting blocked and taking a long time dramatically. I mean, a lot more than uh, sort of 60% or whatever. It's yeah. really, really massive difference. There's much less room for the nasties to hide in something small than there is in something big. Yeah. 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 But just that, so if you know your, you know, your 85th percentile, um, one of the questions you're asking is, when you start a new piece of work, or before you start a new piece of work, is, do we think this is small enough to get done within 16 days in that data set. So if, you, if you're looking at a piece of work and kind of going, whoa, this is way more than 16 days, that's your first signal that maybe you should start breaking it down to the point at which you kind of go, yeah, this, this feels like we can get it done within 16 days. And that's how you start getting the consistency. But you need to, you need to measure it first. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there any clarification you'd add if the context is a team of teams, potentially where the teams are using different <coughs> methods or different structures? Could you apply it just the same as how you've discussed, or is there any uh, tweaks or caveats you would add in that scenario? Um, so if you're doing it at the, at the, I guess, the team level, you need a cons some kind of consistency of workflow. But actually, um, at the, the very minimum is a not started doing done. You're going to get less granularity on your whip aging, probably. Um, but if you can agree a, a similar simple workflow of that, um, but then also you can do this at the, so if your, your team level user stories or whatever you're, you know, you're using, um, if above that you've got something like a, you know, a feature, um, you can do this at the feature level as well. You're going to, features will probably move a little bit more slowly, so you're going to get a little bit less feedback, um, but you know, you'll probably do both. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. So I think it's uh, one of the good takeouts from those famous Spotify videos is the predictability innovation trade-off. Mm -hmm. So I'm just sort of thinking now, I mean, you kind of alluded to it, predictability is just one of the things you can measure and people fetishize it. Just trying to think, ever think you found yourself in situations where you're saying, for Christ's sake, stop trying to be predictable, like maybe even do the opposite? Um, I, I've never seen a team be so predictable and so obsessed by predictability not that... Right? Yeah, yeah. Usually teams are like massively unpredictable or organisations and you're trying to some bring in some stability. In my, in my case, I think it's more management are obsessed with it and are killing off any joy in being in Yeah, some of that is that education around moving to probabilistic thinking from deterministic thinking because they just want to, you know, they, they effectively think of it in terms of 100% probability. So there's, there's, there's a bit of education there. 
usually around shifting to that way of thinking, kind of going, when we say it's a certain date, it's, it's an 85%, so there's still a chance we might not make that. And I guess the other side of it is that I didn't really talk about here, um, is the, not just when you're going to get it, but what you're going to get. So really what you're predicting is, is a number of work items. You're not necessarily deciding what those work items are yet, because you want that to change. As you iterate, as you, you, know, you get feedback um, and you, you kind of pivot, you, the, the, what, what you think is the first 50 items might turn out to be different. Because one, you might be breaking things down into smaller pieces of work, or you know, different priorities come up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if people want to know what am I going to get by a, a particular date, you can then say, well, we've got an 85 percent of doing this many work items. OK, let's work together to figure out, make sure that those, you know, if it's 50 work items, we're doing the most valuable 50 ones. All right. Thank you. <laughs>